Great. I think really fantastic discussion. I think it is great to see a lot of these complex Venus cases as well. It really helps diffuse the, the knowledge of how to approach this. But I think our next case will be arterial. Um, Rasik Ajmal, do you want to present PAD Absorb? I'll get this loaded up. So I'm going to present uh, bioresorbable stents in CLI. Uh, we reviewed about the five articles in literature currently. Uh, and this case is currently part of the study we're doing at our facility as well. I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, one of the most common causes of CLI critical limb ischemia is infrapopulated occlusive disease. In the past decade, techno uh, technical skills and technology have advanced to increase the success rates of baloney lesions. Uh, here's a case of CLI, which we treated with a bioresorbable vascular scaffold. We had a 75-year-old male with multiple risk factors for atherosclerosis. He was referred to us for chronic non-healing ulcer of the right foot, rather for class 5. On physical examination, he had a non-healing ulcer on the right toe, the right big toe, with ABI of 0.64. His diagnostic angiogram showed severe diffuse disease of the proximal right popliteal, followed by complete mid-occlusion, mid-to-distal occlusion. Also, he had a proximal occlusion of the mid-anterior tibial, TP trunk, and posterior tibial arteries. Uh, he underwent a lower right lower extremity intervention by ultrasound-guided right femoral anti-grade approach, ultrasound-guided right pedal retrograde approach, so we went both sides, above and below. And uh, we did multiple sequential balloon angioplasty, and we prepped the vessel using a scoring balloon, and it, uh, finally we placed stents um, in three of the vessels. At six-month follow-up, he had a completely healed ulcer on the right toe and palpable pulses on physical examination. Uh, the procedure details showing the sizes uh, of the balloons and the stents, and mainly we placed a three, uh, the bioresorbable stent, uh, we placed a 3 by 28 millimeter absorbed GT1 stent in the proximal right anterior tibial artery deployed at 3.5. Uh, as you can see, most of the vessels were treated from the SFA all the way down to the dorsalis pedis. And the stents and techniques that we used, uh, mainly we used a crossing uh, technique uh, you call the machete technique, and we used administration of Texas Technics, uh, <laughs> what we use for all our CLI cases at our facility. You're going to tell us what that is. Yes. Yeah, is it the Bobby? Uh, it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Texas barbecue sauce. <laughs> And I'm sorry I couldn't get any videos. We're currently going on an upgrade, so I just was able to get the pictures. Here you see the SFA in the Profunda. Uh, the distal SFA uh, diffusely diseased uh, below the knee angio. And here you see reconstitution of the peroneal nerve in the distal posterior tibial. I'm uh, sorry, peroneal artery in the distal posterior tibial. Uh, the foot angio showing the posterior tibial, uh, but not uh, the deep, uh, dorsalis pedis. Uh, here we start the anti-grade axis. And here's the retrograde axis uh, by the pedal. Uh, we cross the anterior tibial CTO uh, from below, as you can see as a knee implant. Uh, and now we're entering the popliteal from below. Uh, we're going from below from the retrograde axis as well as anti-grade axis. And here we have tunneling. And you can see the knee is folded uh, because of the knee implant. How many times did you curse your orthopedic surgeons during that case? <laughs> 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 Uh, we started the sequential angioplasty. Uh, again, sequential angioplasty. Uh, here we're crossing the pedal. We are crossing the pedal arch. We remove the uh, retrograde, the axis from below, and we're going from above and crossing the pedal arch. Again, crossing the pedal arch. Uh, flow is established now. Uh, we started the scoring balloon, and uh, we deployed the superior stent in the popliteal. And after balloon angioplasty of the uh, superficial femoral artery, and we're deploying the life stent in the superficial femoral artery, the distal part of the zoo. Here you see both stents, the superior and the popliteal, and the life stent in the superficial femoral, the distal superficial femoral. Uh, then after multiple balloon angioplasties, uh, we couldn't get good flow into the anterior tibial. A decision was made at that time to go ahead and proceed with a bioresorbable vascular scaffold in the anterior tibial. Uh, we have three vessel flow at the end after all three vessels were treated. Um, in conclusion, you can say that bioresorbable vascular scaffolds are, uh, can be used with 
good clinical outcomes and angiographic results. This, the technical aspect on prepping the vessel is crucial as in, uh, for all stents. Uh, the long-term patency and clinical outcomes should be further valued with well-designed randomized control studies. Thank you. So that's a that's a great case of an, obviously an off-label use. I think you know one of the dangers with BVS is I think we've seen in the in the coronary literature is that if you don't prep the vessel well, the it's going to be a disaster. So right. uh, a lot of uh, I'm curious here. I didn't see a ton of calcium. Any thoughts on doing? atherectomy to that vessel beforehand or just you're using scoring balloons or was there we were just using scoring balloons we thought about atherectomy but we weren't on the other vessels we were getting good results with the scoring balloons so we were trying to proceed with the trying to it was kind of a longer case so we were trying to get to get, the end get, get out some of flow. yeah gets no get not get out get some flow down there and then uh, we decided just to go with the bottom normal so obviously stenting here below the knee we have a lot of data here for drug eluding stents here below the knee with mark Bosher's trials and uh, the Achilles trial, and et cetera. And I think, you know, one of the challenges is, is I think we're all looking for that next step, the DCV below the knee. Uh, here you had a 3-5 vessel. Some of us might have used a 4-0 DCV. I think here you have a fluid limiting dissection that required you stenting. So right. I think using BVS is a great off-label use for it. Um, I think it's one of the things is that you can use a drug-coated, uh, I think the drug-coated sense, uh, drug-coated balloons will be coming out, I think, again, uh, hopefully this time working in the next two years. So we'll see kind of where that is. In the meantime, there's also new technologies out there, including the TAC trial that's coming out, technology that where you just do focal stenting uh, instead of the whole vessel. So, but I think for BVS is a great use. Uh, Aaron, do you use BVS in, in this setting? I, I have done some BVS uh, below the knee cases and um, the the cases that I've done have been cases where there's been um, significant dissection or recoil uh, after prolonged balloon angioplasty. I'm not a very big user of uh, drug eluding stents uh, below the knee, uh, either usually less than 10% of the time. My feeling on it has been that although the data has been great, uh, in those studies, they've been limited generally to lesions that are in the range of 30 to 50 millimeters at most. Very and, short lesions. You know, so I think it's a definitely an ideal therapy for a focal lesion where there's a severe residual or something that's not responding to balloon angioplasty. I guess, uh, again, I think as extrapolation from the concerns of absorbed potentially in the coronaries, I've been careful in those cases to uh, size and prep the vessel with the goal of working on a 2.5 vessel or above. And um, I've actually always post-dilated. I don't routinely post-dilate coronary stents below the knee, um, but um, I have post-dilated every absorb that I've put in just on the concern that because of the thicker uh, struts that there could be risk of scapular thrombosis. What I will tell you is that um, I have put in some coronary stents before that were probably slightly undersized and uh, very difficult to reaccess uh, when they occluded. Yes. yes. Uh, it's kind of a nightmare. And uh, so I have had an absorb actually reocclude already once. Um, and it's much easier to get through because it's a polymer. And uh, don't tell anyone from Spectronetics about this, but it looks like the laser probably ablates the absorb as well. <laughs> so uh, I think if you're concerned about the long-term uh, reaccess and things, I think that is a potential advantage uh, of absorb in that case. Yeah, too. I've, I've had a re I had an anterior tibial just like this that re-occluded, and the only benefit that I could think of was when I had to go back through, I literally stuck the leg into the stent mm -hmm. to go through it. So yeah. I had a nice mark to where to go. That was the only time I actually cared about having it there because otherwise it was just you know, I do think the goals, though, of, of CLI care is different in terms of long-term yeah. patency. I think mm -hmm. if you look at long, diffuse tibial disease, if you use any strategy uh, that's not a drug looting stent, you have at least 50% restenosis at nine months. DES and focal disease gets you probably restenosis less than 20% of the time, which heals most wounds. And I think restenosis does not lead to redevelopment of these wounds if there's good wound care and offloading. And so I do think Aaron has seen a lot of my patients at the VA that have quite a few tibial stents, mm -hmm. which I still think is better than uh, balloon angioplasty, but it's expensive. Uh, but for limb salvage, I think it's probably, probably worth it. I would say though, I mean, it's hard um, to put in a bioabsorbable when you can put in DES when the DES data is at least reasonable where the bioabsorbable data is not, especially with the, the vessel prepping issue that you need to do. And I usually do post-dilate the, the drug looting stents do down there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing just to be cognizant of is you can't put these, uh, these stents in places where there's any flexion at all or near the ankle. Because I've had a, a couple of my patients who have crushed their tibial stents because of physical trauma, you know, bumping their legs. 
in that situation, you won't be able to get through them for sure. Yeah, um, I, I actually, or yeah. please don't put these in uh, um, reverse tibial graphs that go into the, the, on the outside of the leg. I've watched a few of mine crush, and then what you have, you, you basically you just have to crush it again yeah, from the right. inside. So I think, I think going to your point, Tom, I think you were kind of a, a leader on the saying that we need functional outcomes in CLI, not just patency outcomes. I don't, I don't care about the restenosis rate. I care if the wounds heal, right? That's what really matters. And here it looks like you had a great outcome. Three vessel runoff from nothing before. I'm sure that guy healed in probably four yeah. weeks, six weeks. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. About four weeks, yeah. So just to add on, this guy came to my clinic uh, two weeks ago for a nine month follow up and he had palpable pulses and the wound was completely healed. I've so far done almost like 11 of these cases and all of them on follow up, six month follow up that we have so far, and eight of them, there are palpable pulses. And I used to do drug eluting stents on just the proximal part. And usually when the balloon angioplasty gave me good results, I would just use the drug coated balloons just to paint it and they would show patency. But if you don't have good flow after multiple scoring balloon and sequential balloon angioplasty, only then I proceed with doing the stents. Drug, drug eluting stents would give the results, but I've seen with if the vessel is prepped well and you go ahead with putting these stents in, and you see good results, and two years down the road, if it occurs that the wound is healed and the stent is no more there, at least what you were right, crossing those drug eluting stents in the future, that's troubling. This would not be there in two years. Yeah, it's a so great that's application. one advantage you have over there. And this is still an area which needs more study, but so far the results that we have seen is amazing. Yeah, and there, I mean, there are some small single center publications looking at this. Uh, Ramon Varco uh, in Australia, I think, probably has the most published experience in the world, and there's been, I think, two articles, one in Jack, one in Jack Interventions, and at least in their data, they did report pretty impressive patency. Uh, so it's possible that the absorb behaves differently below the knee than it does in the coronaries. Um, we've also learned a lot about coronary absorb, so figuring out how to optimize in that for for peripheral um, uses is um, could be could be good in that regard if it does help improve patency. But again, to Tom's point, it's about the wound healing, and so I think... I think we all believe that having better patency is good for the patient in the long run. It may be that it's going to re prevent recurrent CLI, but it may not um, uh, be the major determinant of the initial wound healing. I think also low yield, I mean, low uh, threshold to use IVUS if need be to optimize your stent outcomes. Absolutely, yeah. Actually, I neglected to mention that the, the, the absorb cases that I have done below the knee, I've extrapolated my coronary experience and used IVUS. I don't actually routinely use IVUS below the knee. I probably should more. Because every time I do, I realize that I grossly undersize yeah. <laughs> the balloon angioplasty. So I think that uh, that's, especially with drug-coated balloons too, that's one of the theories why they didn't work in the impact deep study was that uh, the drug-coated balloon that's being used, they, if you don't have vessel wall apposition, you're not going to get paclitaxel into the artery. Uh, so I think that uh, there probably is a role for increased imaging to help both optimize the acute outcome with the absorb, but also just to get a better, uh, better long-term result with better luminal gain. So great, great job, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, I totally forgot the most important yeah, question. Yeah, that was a <laughs> so, question. It's a take home. Here. So machete technique is a technique that I trialed on the cadavers in our basement of rotatory mechanism using some Asahi wires with a crossing catheter. And we've seen really good results. And I practice a lot with one of my mentors, Dr. Mustafa on that. And it's a technique that we use for tibial crossing and almost so far, when I've applied this technique, we have almost crossed every single time. Tech solution is a solution. We used to use a lot of graph mix, and that we used to use for really, really bad graphs. So I, we just uh, twitched up a little of those medications and added nitro. So it's a, um, nifedipine, verapamil, adenosine, and nitro with a slight heparin combo that we made to apply for these CLI cases. And we're going to present this study in coming, year, coming days to another conference. So far, we have used it on almost 22 cases, and we never had troubles regarding our crossing and stuff like that. Is it red, red, or red also? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we would add that on for future. <laughs> it's Bobby Knight on it. Oh, my God. Yeah.